Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Eva Nico, and I'm GuideStar's Senior Director of Programs. Welcome to the Untapped Fundraising Potential Demystifying Donor Advised Funds webinar. Today's webinar is special. We've developed it in partnership with Fidelity Charitable, the market leader in donor advised funds. On today's webinar, I would like to welcome my fellow speaker and co-host, Amy Pirozolo, Vice President and Head of Marketing at Fidelity Charitable. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Eva. Great to be here. We are so glad that you're all here. We have had a lot of interest in this webinar, over 2,500 registrants and currently and climbing over 600 and 80 participants. So let's make the most of our time. Before we delve into the content, I, I want to help you fully participate in today's webinar and share a few logistics. So that you can relax and be present, know that you will be receiving a, a recording of this webinar after, after the presentation, and you will also get a, the presentation in PDF form, all of, those, all of those slides that we'll share. If you have a question along the way, please share it. In your control panel for GoToWebinar, there should be a little questions tab, and you can type your question in there and submit it, and we will be monitoring for those coming throughout the presentation. At about the last 10, 10 minutes of the webinar, we'll be able to answer some of those questions. Now, with over 750 participants, we likely won't get to all of your questions, but they won't be wasted. We will be looking for some of the themes and patterns and handle as many as we can, and then we might be able to tailor some future content in webinars or blogs in order to address some of the other questions that come in. So thank you in advance for fully participating. Now let's talk a little bit about what you'll get out of today's session. Whether you know a lot about donor advised funds or are new to DAFs, you'll get something out of this webinar. We'll be sharing insights about donors gleaned from an analysis of over 100,000 donors giving behavior, courtesy of Fidelity Charitable. We will also give you some practical strategies about how to connect with those donors and how to incorporate DAFs into your fundraising strategy. And finally, we'll be giving you a, a, a real sense of what the donor sees about your organization when they're in the Fidelity Charitable Giving Experience and how that connects with your GuideStar profile. And we'll give you some tips for making that profile look amazing and tell your full story. So let's dive in. Individual donors are driving philanthropic giving. This is a very busy slide, but I just want you to focus on the fact that that green circle, which tells you kind of the sources of charitable giving, that green three quarters almost, over 70%, is due to giving by individuals. So they account for a lot of charitable giving, and they have lately a lot accounted for a lot of the growth in charitable giving as well. So that's pretty exciting, and a number of those individuals especially the ones that have more of the means, do their giving through a donor-advised fund. And that's why we're so excited to give you a little bit more of an insight into how those funds work and what those donors are looking for and what they see about your organization. Now, you might think, well, what does GuideStar have to do with all of this? We essentially serve as the data hub for information about nonprofit organizations. So we gather information for and about nonprofits, and we share it through GuideStar and through many other partners. Many of the platforms that are facilitating charitable giving online. That means that your GuideStar information is reaching potential donors not just on our site, but through many other websites and giving experiences. 
Now, to give you a little bit of a sense of that, you know, here are some of the partners that we work with to facilitate online giving, giving through donor advised funds, giving as part of grant management systems for foundations. Of course, the partner I would like to highlight today is our work with Fidelity Charitable. So Amy, I'd love for you to say a little bit more about who Fidelity is and the work that you do. Great, thanks Eva. Again, we are so excited to be participating on this with you. Uh, I'm sure many people on the call uh, know who Fidelity Investments is as the leader in providing retirement, brokerage, and financial guidance to millions of individual investors. And you might also assume that uh, Fidelity has a foundation, which we do. Um, our uh, private foundation was established in 1965. Um, it's a non-operating foundation, and uh, it, it was set up to support organizations and communities uh, around Fidelity employee sites focused on uh, community development, social services, arts, arts and culture, as well as health and education. And the grants from our uh, private foundation are made by program staff. And Ariel, I'm trying to advance the slides. There we go. Okay. Uh, what many folks uh, don't really know about Fidelity, though, is they don't really know what uh, Fidelity Charitable is. They often confuse it with the Fidelity Foundation, um, and uh, if they um, and don't really know what a donor advised fund is. So Fidelity Charitable is a separate nonprofit 501c3 organization governed by a separate board of trustees, and again, we operate uh, what's called a donor advised fund. Donors, in this case, are the ones making the contributions and making the grant recommendations, unlike our, our private foundation where we have program staff who are making those decisions. Fidelity didn't really invent donor advised funds. They've been around since 1931 and were first pioneered by the New York Community Trust. However, we really did help to popularize them. By the investments we made in technology, we've been able to drive scale and bring opening minimums of accounts down to $5,000 and the minimum for grants down to $50. And so they really have become, um, you know, a, a great way for people across uh, all walks of life to be able to give to charity. So just real quickly, uh, in case you don't fully understand what a donor advised fund is, the way I always explain it to people is think about it as your own personal mini foundation where Fidelity Charitable is doing all of the administration and back office work for you, or as a um, giving checkbook, if you will. The idea is donors uh, can make a donation to Fidelity Charitable. They, uh, the minimum, again, is $5,000. They then can take an immediate tax deduction for that donation because it's irrevocably, irrevocably been given to charity. You then, as the quote-unquote advisor on the donor advised fund, uh, advise us on how you want to invest that money over time to grow for charity. And then lastly, you are also advising us on where that money should be granted out and what charities and what organizations you choose and wish to support. Today, there are more than a 1,000 charities with donor advised fund programs, from community foundations to issue-specific organizations to national DAF. There's now an estimated 285,000 donor advised fund accounts, according to the National Philanthropic Trust's 2016 report, which is the most recent uh, data available. Uh, today, DAFs outnumber foundations three to one, and they're actually growing at a faster pace of almost four to one of, of private foundations. We'll talk in a, in a minute a little bit more about why we're seeing this growth in donor advised funds. But I also wanted to highlight that while DAFs are still uh, DAFs are still less than 10% of that total giving that Eva showed on on one of the earlier slides. Um, but while this is true, they're growing in significance. Last year, total giving from DAFs was about 23 billion dollars, and that was growing at a pace of about 17% compared to overall giving, growing at about three or four percent. So again, they're truly uh, growing in popularity, and it's an important source that we know you all want to tap into. 
The national growth story for Donor Advised Fund is also Fidelity Charitable's story. At the end of last year, we had almost 180,000 donors represented across 109,000 giving accounts. But more importantly, the dollars granted out of our funds to charities has tripled in the last 10 years from $1 billion to $4.5 billion, supporting over 125,000 charities, almost twice that of a decade ago. This makes us, on behalf of our donors, the second largest grant maker behind the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The impact of this rapid growth is really being felt in the sector, and so it's raised a lot of questions. Who are these donors? Are they giving? Where are they giving? And why are they giving? And so that was really the impetus for us in starting our annual giving report back in 2013. The report analyzes the behavior of our donors uh, based on everyone in our database. So my plan is to share that with you today. But before I jump to the data, I'd love to share a story. If there is a typical donor, um, that donor would be Mike Bradley. I love Mike's story. Mike was given a scholarship when he was young, which helped him with his education. And he ultimately went on to be extremely successful, holding multiple leadership positions and ultimately the CEO for a publicly traded semiconductor company. Reflecting on that generosity from his youth, he really wanted to find a way to give back and repay some of his good fortune. So like, like many of our donors, Mike started his giving account when he was later in his earning years and thinking about retirement. He gave appreciated securities because of the ability to reduce his taxes while maximizing what he could give to charity. As you see here on the slide, what Mike really likes about giving to the Donor Advised Fund is that it really allows him to focus on his giving as opposed to the movement of money and all of the technical execution of giving. And by giving through a DAF, he's able to give when he had the money, but take the time to decide which nonprofits to support, meanwhile investing the money to grow further. Mike is also then able to support multiple organizations with just one gift. Mike's initial gift to the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless was because he heard about them on the radio and was really inspired by their work and decided that they were an organization he wanted to support. Because he already had money in his staff, this really enabled him to kind of be spontaneous in his giving. As a result of this gift, the folks at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless contacted him and invited him in for a tour. This further cemented his support of the organization, and Mike has continued to be a strong supporter of theirs. So you will see how Mike really embodies the motivations and behaviors of DAF donors. They are strategic and committed. Many donors open accounts as they approach retirement age, just like Mike. The goal is to use it during retirement. They're at a point in their lives when they're really ready to start to focus on philanthropy. The average age of opening typically is about 55. Our donors are also highly engaged, giving to multiple charities, and with 79% of them saying they have volunteered in the last year. We also know that giving through a DAF is not their only way of giving. Among our DAF donors, 91% have also given using cash, and 15% say they also use a private foundation, a community foundation, or some other giving vehicle. What we find is that donors are saying that they use cash for their more casual giving, for example, supporting somebody in a race walk, whereas they use a DAF uh, and their other vehicles for more strategic giving. Another myth that people often have about DAFs is that they're only for the wealthy, yet we know we serve a wide range of donors. While we have more than 12,000 donors with a current balance of more than $250,000, including many more significantly than that, Nearly 60% of our donors have a current balance under $25,000. However, no matter the size of the account, a common thing we see across all of our donors is that they're making a long commitment to giving through their accounts, and they open up an account to help them achieve these goals. The second thing we really see about these donors is that they seek both the financial benefits of giving as well as open up an account for kind of strategic planning. And I, I talked about this just a minute ago. The financial reasons um, are obviously, you know, 90% will say, you know, 
I, you know, part of the reason I, I give or part of what motivates me is the fact that I, I am able to take a, a tax deduction on that. Another 76% of donors say that they specifically open the account to be able to donate appreciated assets. And while the majority of our donors, um, for most of them, this is uh, the form of appreciated publicly traded stock, one of the things we've built significant expertise in is the ability to monetize non-publicly traded assets such as restricted, restricted stock, real estate, cryptocurrency, even, yes, bushels of corn. Uh, last year alone, we took in almost a billion dollars of contributions in these non-publicly traded or what we call more complex assets. Many donors have at least one large, what we saw, sometimes call a hidden asset. It's hidden in the sense they may not have thought about using it for charity or don't know how to get it to charity. So we make it easy for them to contribute that asset, and this in turn makes it so much easier for them to support multiple charities with just that one gift. This is a win for the donor, enabling them to give their most tax efficient asset, but we also know that this is truly creating funds for charity that might not have already been available. 76% of donors also cite that investment growth is another key motivator for opening a donor advised fund account. Since our inception, we've generated, excuse me, more than 4.5 billion in additional charitable dollars through investment growth, which means more money available to you, the end charities. Then if we flip to their motivations behind, you know, strategic giving and planning, uh, a donor advised fund really allows donors to see all their giving in one place. It kind of separates this notion of when you have the money available to giving you more time to decide what causes and what nonprofits you want to support. In fact, 62% of people say they've opened an account because they want to be able to sustain their giving in retirement. They know they're giving now when they're in their earning years, but they want to be able to continue to support the key causes that are important to them. 27% say because they have this financial windfall. Again, it's this notion of give when you have the money, but give you some time to investigate, research, and decide what causes you want to support. And then 26% say that they have opened a donor advised fund to um, be able to engage their families. The other trend we're seeing as donor advised funds grow in popularity is that we're seeing kind of a trend away from endowed giving and more to what we're calling giving while they're living. Last year, the average number of grants per account was 9.7, with an average grant size of $4,246. Additionally, we had about 505 grants over a million dollars, and a, which was a 25% increase over the previous year. So what we're seeing is as the account, these accounts grow, it's really enabling more and more donors to make more significant gifts to the causes they care about. And if we look at our donors' behavior on a first-in, first-out basis, we know that three-quarters of the dollars contributed are granted out within the first five years, and that jumps to nearly 90% by 10 years. So within a decade, almost all money that's been contributed to a Fidelity Charitable Giving account has been granted out to charity. So again, we're seeing that our, our uh, donors are very, very active um, and definitely um, focused on granting this money out to charity. Their giving patterns, interestingly though, uh, really mirror that of national trends that you see in giving um, through Giving USA and other sources. You'll see here that in the vast majority of states, roughly 50% of all grants are going to local organizations in the state in which the donor resides. Our donors' giving patterns similarly mirror what we're seeing, how giving um, kind of breaks across the different sectors. About 43% of donations go to the top two sectors of education and religion, just as they do nationally. However, our numbers you can see are slightly flipped, where uh, education is slightly ahead of uh, religion. And we think this reflects the high education levels of DAF users. Typically, most of most staff users are successful, college educated, and again, are wanting to give back to some of the organizations that helped lead to their success. 
Among our most popular nonprofits, our donors supported last year, were the American Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, and the Salvation Army. Although the caveat I should give here is that with supporting over 125,000 charities, it really is very, very individualized. Um, these top three um, kind of what we call most popular uh, nonprofit organizations uh, received about 9,000 grants from uh, grants from about 9,000 different giving accounts. But as you look further down the list, it quickly drops off of, off of that um, because the giving really, as you can imagine, with 125,000 nonprofits that we're supporting, um, really um, becomes uh, almost one to one in that you know we often have just one grant going out to one nonprofit. Um, so again, while we have some top nonprofits that are supported through our donors, uh, it really is a wide range and continues to grow almost tenfold um, uh, or twice. We're supporting twice the number of nonprofits that we did almost ten years ago. So to sum it all up. Our DAF donors take a strategic approach to their giving. They're actively supporting the causes they care about, both in their volunteering and in active grant making from their accounts. They're also using numerous methods of giving. The DAF is certainly not their, their sole way of supporting charity and the causes they care about. And they're actively giving to local causes in their community. But let's explore one of the most important topics of the webinar, which is strategies you can employ for reaching these donors. And we really bucket them into three key strategies. First is recognizing the donor while being aware that they're using the DAF vehicle. The second is make it easy to them to give to your organization from their donor advised fund account. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then last, what we're going to wrap up is keeping your profile on GuideStar um, fresh and compelling. So first, it might seem really basic, but one of the things we see that nonprofits aren't always doing is simply flagging DAF donors in their database and acknowledging the donor and not us. Um, we often receive letters saying, thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and it's really not Fidelity Charitable that needs to be recognized. It's really the donor. Most donors are giving to organizations where they have a strong existing relationship and they're seeking or they're seeking to build a strong relationship. And while they can give anonymously out of their account, we find that very few are actually using that feature. In fact, less than 3% of all grants go out anonymously. So you really want to reach out to these donors for two reasons. One is they're giving publicly and they want acknowledgement just as much as any other donor. And two, it gives you the ability to target these donors for a closer relationship. Again, keep in mind, these are donors that have made a commitment to giving. Um, if they've given you even a $50 grant, um, they are sitting on an account that they have given irrevocably to charity. And so you really want to think about how to engage them. Many donors are like Mike. He donated for the first time to the Boston Health Healthcare Center for the Homeless. And after um, uh, being invited in, uh, he was further engaged and continued to support them. That might have been Mike hearing about them on the radio and making his first contribution to them may have been kind of the first time and the last time. But they invited him in, they gave him a tour, they showed him the love. The second thing that we really encourage folks to do um, is really think about the fact that these folks are planners. Um, and the donors are at the same stage of life um, when they're opening a DAF, they're at the same stage of life as when they're considering other forms of legacy planning. So we really encourage you as you begin to develop a relationship with these folks to target them for um, overall planned giving appeals. You'll see here in this slide that 42% um, uh, of Fidelity Charitable donors have set up some sort of uh, bequest or legacy giving vehicle, and that is much higher than the overall average. So again, you really want to be thinking about talking to these folks once they've made one uh, grant to your organization about bringing them in, helping them learn more about your organization, encouraging them to make uh, set up a reoccurring grant to your organization, and maybe long-term setting you up as 
um, the legacy to receive the proceeds of your account once they pass away. The last thing we really encourage folks to do is to set up DAF Direct. DAF Direct, we worked with several other DAF sponsors to create DAF Direct. It's a web tool that you can place on your website so donors um, can give directly from their DAF to the nonprofit. The great thing about this tool is that once it's on your site, if a donor clicks on the DAF Direct tool, it automatically takes them to the login page for their account and then automatically populates your information into the grant workflow um, with your name. There's no guessing about whether they have the right chapter or the right name. It automatically populates, as you can see in the right-hand uh, side of this page. The example I used here is the St. LeBray Indian School. So I cannot stress enough that whether you are um, using DAF Direct or not, you always want to make it clear to donors that they should be thinking about using their DAF account to support you. So before I wrap up and hand it over to Eva, I want to quickly just share a case study uh, that I think really brings it home. Um, the case study is the St. LeBray Indian School. This is an organization in Montana whose mission is to provide first-class education to hundreds of Northern Cheyenne and Crow children at three schools. They began actively promoting giving from your DAF in the fall of 2016. They put DAF Direct on their website. They mentioned using your DAF in all of their other communications. And the list they saw was phenomenal, a 30% increase in funding from DAF donors from 2015 to 2016. And the last time I spoke to Rachel, their development officer, their 2017 gifts, had already surpassed what they had received in 2016 in about the first nine months of the year. They hadn't even gone through giving season last year, and they already had more contributions from DAF donors, again, as a result of really promoting this. So I just think that's an awesome case study of somebody who really was very thoughtful about tagging and flagging and recognizing who these donors are, and then really um, promoting giving using your DAF uh, account uh, through all of their educational and outreach materials. The final thing you'll want to do um, in making sure that um, you're reaching these donors is keeping your profile on GuideStar current and compelling. And before I turn it over to Eva, uh, Eva had asked me to just quickly show the, what that experience looks like on our website. So on this, on this last slide here, you'll see that um, the left-hand side shows what a donor experiences in our actual site. And you can see here that they can click on Research a Charity. That automatically will take them to the GuideStar site and to St. LeBray's Indian School page. So again, this is why you, know, you want to make sure that you're looking really good um, in the GuideStar site. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eva, and she'll provide some hints and tips for how to do that. Thank you, Amy. This was a lot of interesting content and insight on DAF donors. We've also seen a lot of really great questions coming through the questions feature. Um, we'll hold many of them till the end, but there's one that does seem to come up consistently a lot of our folks are paying attention to the news and the new tax law that's been passed and wondering about the implications of the new tax law for DAFs and DAF donors specifically. Um, would you like to speak to that, Amy? Sure. So certainly, you know, we uh, tell all donors to uh, consult with their individual tax advisor um, and, you know, it, it uh, the impact of the tax changes kind of is all over the board, but certainly for some donors um, who, you know, do not hit the, the minimum, we're suggesting that um, you might want to consider bunching. And one of the things that um, actually the both the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal had a story on is the value of a donor advised fund to allow you to, again, kind of contribute in one year 
and then have that money to give over the next several years. And then maybe you give again in another, in a third or a fourth year um, or a second year. Again, depending upon your, your uh, specific situation, um, that may be advantageous. So that's just one example. We do have a lot of, I don't want to take too much time on, on this call regarding that, but we do have an entire um, page on our website um, which explains kind of the specific changes to uh, taxes in regards to charitable giving and what it might mean for donors. Um, so you might want to check that out uh, after this uh, discussion. Fabulous. Thank you, Amy. So let's talk a little bit about the information that you as an organization can share that many of the donors who are working through Fidelity Charitable will be seeing. I mean, I think page 27 tells you the scoop, gives you the scoop, which is they're really seeing your full GuideStar profile from within the Fidelity Charitable experience um, if they're looking up organizations. So let's talk a little bit more about how to make sure that that profile looks, tells your full story. So one of the things that we focus on, you know, first, many nonprofits realize that they, whether they they know it or not, either they already have a GuideStar profile. And for many of them, I think there's a misconception. They think, well, I'm already on GuideStar. I'm listed because I'm a public charity. I'm listed on the IRS with the IRS. Therefore, I'm, guide, I'm, I'm on GuideStar already and I'm done. Well, that's only partly true. You, of course, do have a listing on GuideStar as a public charity, but your profile is likely not telling your full story. Essentially, what, what the, the publicly available information that flows through GuideStar is the information that com comes from your tax form. And I don't know about you, but I, I certainly don't want my tax form to serve as my kind of face into the world. And I don't want that for you all as an organization either. So let's talk a little bit more about what you can do to actually tell the world and DAF donors specifically about some of the work that you do, um, the work that really matters. So if you go on your GuideStar profile, if you just, you know, Google yourself and look for your GuideStar profile, you might see a graphic like this. Um, if you do see a graphic like this, it means that your profile has not been claimed before. It means that only that, that tax information is going on GuideStar and none of the information about your programs and your actual work. Um, we do ask organizations to come to us and essentially claim their profile. It means that you demonstrate that you can represent the organization that you want to represent. So we ask for proof of that because we don't want just folks willingly to be altering other people's profiles. Um, so we ask for you to claim it, to tell us you know, which organization and how you're connected with it. And then you can essentially create an account on GuideStar and go in and modify the profile and especially add additional information. So what I recommend folks do is that they go to www.guidestar.org, they create an account on GuideStar and verify their email. That's how we know we're connected with a real person and not a robot. And we know that you, you say who you say you are and it allows us to communicate with you about your profile. Um, and then afterwards, you can click Update Nonprofit Profile, and it will take you just through a few steps, essentially to select the organization you want to claim, submit some basic information, including your employer identification number. That's kind of the number assigned to you by the IRS. Um, one thing that we recommend is that you use your work email if possible. It does make the approval process faster and smoother. So that's what we recommend nonprofits do, um, come to GuideStar and claim their uh, nonprofit profile on GuideStar. And essentially what that means is that you are able to add information to your profile. And we recognize nonprofits for adding information, for being transparent with donors, with four seals of transparency. So we allow nonprofits to share basic information at the bronze level, 
And what that essentially does, it means that your organization can actually be found. So when you saw that little search experience in Fidelity, you know, in order to power that search experience, a, a few pieces of basic information are needed. Your name, your address, the contact information, some basic information about your programs. You also want to show up with hopefully your logo and your mission statement, and those are all the things that belong at the bronze level that really help your organization be identified and found. The silver level is about financial transparency. Donors are savvy these days. They look at financials, they see, they want to see how an organization is doing, how it's operating. And so at the silver level, we ask you to share that info. At the gold level, you're talking about your strategy and your goals as an organization. And this is a chance for you to tell uh, in your own words a bit more of your story and what you're trying to accomplish. And then finally, our newest level and highest at, the, at platinum is basically about how your organization measures the difference, the results that you're trying to achieve. And we'll talk a little bit more about platinum soon, as that is often intimidating for folks to approach. One of the things I want to emphasize is that these SEALs really do recognize nonprofits for sharing of information. They are not a rating. And that the ability to claim your profile on GuideStar and add this information is free. It means you don't have, you know, you're not paying GuideStar anything for doing that. Um, obviously, we recognize that you are investing your time in sharing this current information with donors. Um, and so we don't have an additional charge for that. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about the, the different levels. So we have just recently released our 2018 Seals of Transparency. So in order to be truly transparent, in order to share information, you want your information to be current. So we do ask folk, folks to refresh their information on at least an annual cadence, and many come in more often as new information is available. So if they change their address or if if you're uh, perhaps adding a program or if you've just completed your tax information or your audit, many folks come in and share the most current info so that it's in front of potential donors and, and supporters in an ongoing way. But we do offer a best practices guide to the information that we'll be asking you about. And as you can see, it's kind of correlated with the level and it tells you how some of the system works. I think one of the things that I see folks being excited about, and I was talking with someone the other day, and they said, you know, I really believe in having this kind of transparent information online, and I want to be at Platinum. Um, and they right away went into GuideStar, claimed their profile, and wanted to fill in the Platinum information. And I had to pull them back just a little bit um, and say, well, before you can be Platinum, you actually have to share some of the, you have to share the bronze level required information the silver, the gold, and the platinum. The levels really build on each other, and they tell your full story because a metric doesn't make a lot of sense if you don't have a lot of context for the work that an organization does. So you really want to earn bronze, then silver, then gold, and then platinum. So let's talk a little bit more about what that means. So at the bronze level I mentioned, you know, it's the first level. It basically asks you for some basic information, your organization's name, your EIN, your mailing address. I know this is a little bit of a silly use case perhaps, but you know, a lot of folks do move offices or move addresses. Obviously you update it on your website really quickly, but if there are you know, hundreds of platforms using your information, you might be in for hundreds of different systems that you would have to work with to just update that basic piece of info. And obviously if you go on GuideStar and update it there, we make sure that that information flows through all these other experiences. I want to call out some of the changes we also recently made. So first of all, we cl clarified the payment information. Now, I'm sure all of you want to make sure that if someone's trying to give to your organization, they actually have your payment address and your legal name so that they, that can actually happen without any miscommunication or, or mishap. So that's something that we ask about. Um, there's some basic info about who leads the organization, 
And then the bottom section is very important. So it's the, inform it's the information about your programs and essentially where you do your work. That's kind of the map portion. Um, there's a little bit of keywords um, that you can put in that just, again, help identify your organization. And finally, we ask for some of the brand elements that you might have, like your logo or your tagline or your website that again help that show up in these giving experiences online. And if you don't have some of those, if you don't have a logo or a website, that's okay. There's an option for you to say that you don't have one. That's particularly important for newer organizations. So on the, I wanted to just give you a quick flavor of how we display the maps, um, the geographic area served. It's the newest kind of highlight on the profile. Essentially, you know, we want nonprofits to be able to say, here's kind of where my service area is, where I do my work. And that could be, you know, the world. If you're, for example, an online company, it could be the U.S., it could be a state or a city. So we allow you to select a geographic area served um, from within the GuideStar experience to show that. And that's particularly relevant to donors who really want to give more locally they probably will be looking, you know, who gives within my county or within my within my city. The next level at Silver really is, as I mentioned, the financial info. And there's really two options to complete this. The quickest way to complete this level is to get your audited financial statement. Hopefully a number of us I know are in the midst of working on those latest ones right now. And to upload the financial statement and state your fiscal year, um, and then essentially you're done with silver. If you have some of the information, but you're not big enough to have an audited financial statement, there's a way for you to enter some of these key fields into the updating experience for your profile. And I should mention that you know there are some fields here that I highlighted in red, and these are the fields that are required to achieve that level of transparency. And then there's a, additional optional fields that are in the gray, which are, um, again, recommended because many folks do pay attention to them, but they're not necessary to achieve that level. So you can decide you know, how much time you're, you have to update the profile, what information that is available, um, and if you complete the required fields, you achieve the level, and then you can provide the recommended information if you feel that that reflects your work more, um, more specifically. So at the gold level, uh, it's easy on the face of it. Uh, there are basically five questions that are just text, text-based. What is your organization aiming to accomplish? What are your strategies for making this happen? What are your capabilities? How will you know if you're making progress as described in your words? And what have you accomplished so far that you're most proud of? And what's next? What are you looking ahead to do? And Amy mentioned that DAF donors are strategic. Um, that means that they are paying attention to how the organization, you know, what they're trying, what you're trying to achieve, um, and how you think about your progress and what you're looking to do next. That's something that that they might be interested in. Now, some folks look at this and and feel, oh boy, this is another you know long kind of application that I need to write, and I would encourage you to use the information that you already have and to use it judiciously. And what I mean by that is, you know, grab your latest annual report or your strategic plan, take a look at your already existing website. There is a ton of content there that can help you answer these questions. You do not need to reinvent the wheel on this one. Um, and at the same time, be mindful that as someone, you know, on the other side, sitting and reading this information, they are really looking for a glanceable snapshot, something they can look at and review and understand. They are not looking for volumes of information um, to read through, especially on a screen. Now, so what I would say is treat these, these words as sort of like car carbs. You know, limit your carb intake a little bit here. Um, make sure that the presentation, uh, the information is kind of short and to the point, um, and so that folks have more of a chance to actually read it and engage with it. So let's talk a little bit about platinum, the highest level. 
So in Platinum, you have the opportunity to talk about the metrics that you use to track your progress and to share the quantities that you're tracking. So what I mean by that is you are able to select metrics from the GuideStar Common Results Catalog, that's a curated list of metrics, and if there are none there that fit the bill for your organization, um, you are able to add a custom metric that you, you know, you enter the text for the metric, you describe it, and that, that essentially means that you are most able to, you know, basically tell us what you already measure as opposed to needing to fit um, something that's predefined. And what we feel is that, you know, we are, const it's kind of like crowdsourcing of metrics. We are constantly learning from nonprofits who come in through the Platinum experience and tell us more about their work in their own words. And then we are helping the catalog grow as we see those nonprofits participating. So essentially what you do is enter a metric, then you talk about what results you have achieved and you can report on the last available year, in this case 2017. And then I do advise if you have a couple of years of metrics going back, um, that you are also able to share you know, maybe two or three years worth, worth of data. And that's kind of good because it gives the donor and the viewer a context for what you're sharing, how that's changed over time. So that's that's valuable. And then this is this is why it's also important to keep your information current. So when the 2019 seals of transparency come out, we'll be asking for an update to some of the metrics. Um, you also have a chance to give a little context in your own words to what the metrics are and what they look like. So that's just a little primer on Platinum that I hope is helpful. There are a lot more resources on our website as well. So I will say that one of the most commonly misunderstood things about our interface is you know, uh, that you enter in the information uh, and we do allow you to save the information in draft form. You, you, know, you might wanna reach out to colleagues to confirm a number, you might wanna have a question, you might want your executive director to review what you did, and that's fine, and you can just save, um, I would say save, 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 to make sure that, that it's in there. Um, and then when you're ready for the information to be public, you need to, what, you need to actually press the publish button. So there is a, you know, there's a section here that says confirm and publish, and that's what you'll need to do in order to make the information that you've provided public on your profile. And that's a little bit of a confusion. You know, we're all used to Google spreadsheets where everything saves all the time and it's, you know, real time all the time. Here, we're deliberately creating an opportunity for nonprofits to come in to kind of save and draft their info and then when they're ready to publish. And if you have an update, you can just publish again. There's nothing terrible that will happen if you publish multiple times. You can just update the info and publish again and it will again show up on the profile. The benefits and rewards section also tells you a little bit more about, um, number one, actually gives you access to the seals of transparency. So if you want to publicize those on social media or on your website or elsewhere, you'll have access to those images and to a clickable kind of widget that, uh, again, displays the seal on your website. And then there's some other benefits and rewards within those sections as well um, for participating. So I think we've really talked through some of the key strategies, you know, reaching out to donors, making sure that you are connecting with them. I'd like to say donors are people too. Um, sometimes we forget that. You make it easy for them to give through their donor advised funds by getting that DAF direct um, capability on your website. And then Something you might not have known is that, you know, they're directly viewing your GuideStar profile from within some of the giving experiences that we just talked about and specifically on Fidelity Charitable. And so I saw a number of questions earlier in the webinar about, you know, how to introduce yourself to donors, how to um, reach those donors. And in many cases, you know, they may be introducing themselves to you already, right, to, to the work of your organization. But I would say that your GuideStar profile is really one of the best ways to make sure that they're seeing good information about you. 
you know, we all do a lot of research online these days, right? That's sort of our first port of call for finding information. And so if your GuideStar profile is up to date, they might, you know, they might be looking, they might be finding it when they go online and they're thinking about their giving. Um, so that's a good way to, to make sure that they have that info that they need about you. We are right on track with about 10 minutes for questions. And so um, I'm going to take a look at some of the many, many questions that have come through and see how we can help. Now, I know when I was glancing at this earlier, Amy, there were some great questions about how Fidelity specifically you know, encourages donors to do their giving while living, right? So we, you, you mentioned that they can make the donation at a particular point of time. It can serve as their giving account or their giving checkbook. Um, that 75% of those donations happen within a pretty short period of time. Um, but can you say a little bit more about how your organization works with donors to make sure that that money is not just kind of sitting there, but is actually being actively uh, working in the community? Yeah, absolutely. It's a common question we receive, and um, this information is in the program circular that we have for our donors on the website. But basically, um, we look at every single account, and if um, a, an account has not made a grant in three years, we will make every effort to contact that account holder and encourage them to make at least one $50 grant out of the account. If we cannot contact them, at year three, we begin making a grant out of the account on their behalf. Um, we will do that up to six years, and at six years, if we have not been able to contact anyone, and the account is entering its seventh year without any activity, any granting activity from the actual donor, we will actually move that money into our Fidelity Trustees Philanthropy account, um, and it is then granted out within 12 months of it being swept over into that account. At that point, we consider the account abandoned. So, Again, we're not really seeing that happen very often uh, with some of the statistics that I shared. Uh, people are actively granting, um, but we definitely have kind of policies and procedures in place and are actively monitoring um, because we want our donors to be active grant makers. That's great, Amy. Thank you for, for sharing that. And then I also saw that, you know, a number of the organizations on the call were, you know, thinking about how it is that the Fidelity Charitable Advisors work with donors. Um, can you say a little bit more about you know, how that happens? Does it make sense for charities to introduce themselves to an advisor or not? Um, and then it, it also sounded like you know, a lot of donors really think about what they're passionate about and you know, do their research online and really know what, what they want to give to already. So. I'm just curious how much of the time they're kind of seeking advice versus how much of the time you know they really know their minds, they're looking within their community more actively. Yeah, so as you can imagine, it it really runs the spectrum. We certainly have donors who um, uh, set up an account and they're setting it up knowing that they want to be philanthropic. They're not really sure where they want to give yet. In other cases, we have people who specifically have set up an account because of um, you know, health or sickness of a loved one or the death of a loved one, and they want to memorialize that person with giving to cancer research or something like that. So it certainly um, runs the range. Um, again, though, uh, you know, we consider ourselves, you know, both cause and geography neutral um, in that we are often um, – providing information to donors. That the best example I have is we certainly provide a lot of educational information. One of the programs we have is called Giving IQ, which helps donors kind of set up their mission statement and think about how and who they want to give to. Um, one of the steps is how to evaluate and talk to nonprofits. So we're typically giving them more general information about how to 
be a better grantor, if you will, um, but we typically are not providing information about which charities to give to. The only exception to that rule might be uh, in the cases of disasters. We often have a lot of our donors calling saying, I know I want to support hurricane relief in Houston. How do I do that? Who's on the ground? So we do work with the Center for D Disaster Philanthropy to vet um, charities that we actually know are active and working on the ground in specific both national and international disasters and we'll provide a list then um, but that's that's more the um, you know not the norm uh, in terms of uh, directing uh, any donors in terms of you know where they should grant their money to thanks Amy that's really helpful for folks to understand and maybe switching a little bit from the kind of strategic to the tactical, I also saw a lot of great questions coming through about that DAS Direct functionality that you mentioned, the sort of tool that folks can put on their own website. And I think the questions were, you know, one, it sounded like it was developed in collaboration between a number of donor advised funds. So when that tool is installed, does it work only for giving through Fidelity Charitable, or is it that other DAFs are also kind of linked through that tool? Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes. So um, we did uh, collaborate with several other folks in the industry to create this tool, uh, and there are currently four people on the platform, so Fidelity Charitable, Schwab Charitable, um, BNY Mellon, uh, Greater Kansas City Community Foundation. Am I missing any? Yeah, I think it's those those four. Um, and so it does not matter who you know. If you that might seem small, like I just said, there were thousands of donor advised fund providers. Um, but if you look at even just those two or three of those, the major the majority of donor advised fund accounts are held by. Fidelity, Schwab, um, and so you are reaching an awful lot of donor advised fund holders through that DAF Direct tool. And again, the purpose of the tool is really to allow them a direct link to auto-populate once they go to their account, to auto-populate your information as the nonprofit into their account and make that granting process really, really easy and not have them guessing do I have the right charity? Do I have the right tax ID? And all those kinds of stumbling blocks that we typically see. Um, so you can go to dafdirect.org to learn more about this, about uh, who the other DAF uh, um, providers are. Um, it is absolutely free. There's no cost. Um, it's just working with your you know, systems team and your IT team to get it set up. Um, as a link on your website. And again, we also have another link that can be used in all of your other uh, promotional materials. Yeah, super helpful, Amy. And I would say in that same vein, I think there were some really great questions coming through about, you know, how does the kind of GuideStar um, a profile process work? So again, just to emphasize some of the things I said, it is for free. Um, to participate on GuideStar as well. Now, we recognize it's an investment of your time. Number two, it is something where when you update the information on GuideStar, it is automatically updated across the platforms um, that we partner with. And obviously, it would be updated on Fidelity Charitable you know, right away um, when you update on GuideStar as well. So you know, you, as a newer nonprofit, you know, I've seen I've seen new nonprofits um, be able to complete the work in probably less than maybe 90 minutes or so. Um, so, you know, it does mean that you want to have some of the information handy to get started, right? You want to have your strategic plan. You want to have your um, you want to have your financial information ready. Uh, you you want to be ready with that info to enter it in, but it can be a quick process if you have your hands on it. And for some of the smaller organizations, it's actually a little easier because you know there's usually one or two folks that are sitting around the table, um, maybe talking about it and doing it together. 
Um, for some of the larger organizations, they have the benefit of a lot of info and maybe a marketing person who's got the logo and the financial person who's got the financials, but then they also need to coordinate with them, right, and get that information. So we do allow multiple managers, as we call them, for each profile, so you can actually have a team of folks working on it as well if that's something that you want to do. So I recognize we are just about on time. So first, you know, thank you, Amy, so much for sharing some of these insights and the great information. Um, we just really appreciate it. Thank you and for hosting this. Um, really appreciate being a part of it and hope it was helpful to everyone. Absolutely. And I will again reiterate that after this webinar, all the registrants and all the folks who have come in will receive the recording, uh, will receive the PowerPoint uh, PDF of this presentation, and will also receive some additional links to resources, the Fidelity Giving Report, um, the, the page that uh, Amy mentioned that's specifically information for nonprofits um, on the Fidelity website, and also the information from GuideStar on kind of the first thing that you should do in order to update your profile on GuideStar and kind of what to do about that. So you will get some resources that will help hopefully take some of the things that you have heard today and help you put them into action. Really appreciate everyone attending and I hope you all have a great day.